That's darn enthusiastic. <laughs> it's good to see all of you. Yeah, this is uh, one of those mornings you get these three-day holidays. You're never sure what's going to happen in church. And having the compressed summer that we now have and because of school, um, we just, you don't know, half staff and short band members and all kinds of stuff. But you're here. And um, that's like noticed in heaven. So we're glad you're with us. Uh, this is... This is the official wearing of the Hawaiian shirt. This, I know, I know. It should have, this should have happened several weeks ago, but we've had the weird weather, and then I don't feel comfortable wearing one until I've been to Tahoe at least once. And Friday, that happened. It was big. So today you get it. I'm sorry. We are in the beginning stages of working through the minor prophets. And uh, the minor prophets are not minor because they're, not, they're insignificant or they haven't got a great message to tell. They are minor because their books are smaller. They had short messages compared to Isaiah or Jeremiah. Those guys talked forever. And their books are long. But these guys usually had a specific uh, audience. They were being sent somewhere to do something that nobody else wanted to do. They were not real welcome people. By the way, I think most of you know that on your iPhone you can, you can look this up. Does everybody know about that? Yeah. We're good with that? If the iPhone's out, we're, we're good. All the notes and everything are uh, on the, the Bible app. Okay. So this particular week we're, we're going after a guy named Obadiah. And we're doing this for your sake. I hope everybody understands this that we're talking about. Because I just, we don't want life church people to be embarrassed when they go to heaven and somebody walks up to you, extends a hand, and says, Hi, I'm Obadiah. Have you read my book? Uh, we do not want you to be those people of saying, Oh, but what? We want you to say, Yes, we read your book. We studied your book. In fact, would you sign my Bible? It's just, it'll go over much better. So we're covering this ground because there really are some significant messages tucked away in these books. This one, Obadiah, is the shortest book in the Old Testament. It's only 21 verses long, one chapter. Obadiah is a little different in that he has, he has a message to a, to, to a group of people, and, and the group of people is not Israel. The group of people is this, this group, this, this country named Edom. And Edom is to the south and to the east of Israel, down below the Red Sea and in that area. Now it's in Jordan, the, the areas in the, the country of Jordan. And, and it was a rough, kind of a rough area, though the Edomites were doing very well. They, uh, they, had, a, uh, they had a pretty good economy. They were in a place that was really hard to kind of get in and out of, uh, so they didn't worry about being overtaken like Israel was overtaken. They, they were uh, well known for being kind of bright people. They had uh, a, a group of uh, very erudite, very bright men that people sought counsel from Ed the Edomites on a regular basis. They were like, uh, as far as their economy, their economy was great at this moment in time. They, they were sort of the Napa Sonoma of, of the Middle East. They, they raised grapes, and their wine is mentioned in a, a number of ancient texts that have survived that people talk about the wine from Edom. And, and, and so the problem was with these people, uh, they began to believe their own press releases. You know? Not that we have that problem uh, ever, that Obadiah, is, is, his message is for them all 21 verses of it. Because God's got an opinion and he wants them to know. And he's not the only one of the minor prophets that ends up prophesying, uh, or major prophets for that matter, prophesying to other countries besides Israel. A primary job and focus was Israel. But, but sometimes these other people played a role and God wanted them to know he hadn't let it slip. And, and Obadiah deals pretty early with, with uh, Edom's problem. He nails it. We're going to read that verse in a moment. But this is that stuff, you know, the, um, 
How many of you, do you understand that when something is true, it's true everywhere? Like if God says something is so, do you, you get it so? That there isn't one set of truth for one set of individuals and another set of truth for others? In this day and age, it's hard to believe in this kind of the, this wishy-washy things go uh, whatever direction I pre- I happened to perceive it. And, and so the Edomites were kind of full of themselves. They, they, were, you know, they were flying high and doing well, and Israel across the border was in deep trouble. And God was dealing with them. God was dealing with Israel. But he wanted Edom to know, you know what, your attitude towards all of this has gotten on my radar. I, I always thought, you know, I, I called this thing the lies we tell ourselves. We tell ourselves a lot of stories, don't we? My mother used to call it spinning a windy. That's (laughs) W-I-N-D-Y. If we were not telling the truth, she'd say, are you spinning a windy? You know, we spin windies on our own heads all the time. We do it for a lot of different reasons to help us survive. That whatever we're not, we don't deal with the truth. But but I've always thought, you know, that the lies we tell. I always thought how wonderful it would be if. If the things we were really thinking actually came up on a big screen behind our heads, so that what's coming out of our mouth, we, we, we can look past that and we can see what's on, on this thing. I think I've always thought that would be a wonderful tool for counseling. It would like save us a lot of time. Now, if that was true, I just honestly am here to tell you, you would not have to worry about me. It's like I've, I have dealt with all of this stuff. I feel like you know, you're very fortunate. You've got a pastor of, of just kind of normal intellect. And, and I don't have, uh, you know, I don't have problems with my ego that way. I'm just a normal guy, and you're, you're just so lucky to have me. And, and what I, you know, I, I realize is that physically, I'm in, you know, I'm decent enough shape. I, I uh, walk past the mirror. I, I you know, I don't, I don't stand there and flex and stuff like that. Because I, I know, you know, there's, you know, like gravity. <laughs> and I know about gravity. And uh, so I don't, I would get caught there. And just as far as a person and what I do for a living, I, I, you know, I'll take a few chances and things, but I'm, I'm not one of those guys out there going to lead you in places that you really shouldn't go, you know? And as far as just being a preacher, I, I know, it's, I have average skills, I know where I, I come from, and I know what's going on. You got, I can tell by the way that you're laughing that you probably don't see it that way, that you have another opinion of me. And uh, I'm, I'm just here to accept that, that uh, and that's all I'm going to say about that. Uh-huh. All right? You get the point. We all have things in our head, and it's part of how we got here. But God is interested in what's in your head. He's interested in you not only knowing truth, but you acting on the truth that you know. Because it's truth that does what? It sets you free. That's the first thing almost everybody knows about truth. There's a lot of other things, but truth will set you free. So the the inverse of that would be those things that aren't true are probably going to do what? Going to take you captive. Going to bind you up. They're going to keep you somewhere where you probably shouldn't be. And that's the problem with Edom. See, Edom has a little, di- a little bit different issue than, say, the Egyptians or the Philistines. The Edomites are relatives. They're family. They're, called, they're a brother nation to Israel. You all know the story of, of Jacob and Esau. You remember those two guys? Twin brothers, fraternal twins. They're, they're, a lot, they, they're not a lot alike. They don't even look the same. But... but Esau was born first, and his brother Jacob came along afterwards, and, and he was a trickster. He, he was a conniver. Jacob was, he was trying to figure out how to get what his brother had. As the a, as a firstborn, Esau was supposed to get the blessings. He was supposed to get the birthright. He was supposed to be the one to inherit the bulk of what his father had. And, and Jacob, the conniver, moved it around and took advantage of his father's blindness and, and got those things passed to him. Well, needless to say, Esau was not happy about this. So Jacob had to flee, and he went on, and God began dealing with him in another place and another time. But eventually he had to come back. 
He had to come back and face his brother. He had to face what he had done to his brothers. He'd become a wealthy man while he was away, married, had kids, lots of kids, uh, 12 or, or 11 at that point. I think there's one more coming. But he's, he's coming back, and, and Esau comes out to meet him, and he's fearful of what Esau's going to do. But Esau's become wealthy on, on his own right, and, and he's, he's kind of come to peace with what his brother did to him. But there was this uneasiness between the two of them, and they lived separately for the rest of their lives. They didn't have a lot to do. Well, out of Esau, one of the nations that came was Edom. They moved down into that area well, where they were at this point in time. Jacob, of course, had his name changed to Israel. God says, instead of the conniver, you're going to be a prince in Israel. And he changes his name, and he puts him in this place that out of his line is going to come eventually the Messiah. And so between these two nations, there has been this uneasiness forever. Sometimes it's just outright hostility. Sometimes they're getting along. If you see them, they beat them, pops up now and then. But at the point in time that we're talking, that Obadiah is prophesying, God has come down hard on Israel. Because Israel was supposed to be something that they no longer were. They were supposed to be the light that the rest of the world looked at. They were, going, they were carrying the story of God, they, the, of Jehovah, the creator, and they had ignored it and gone after other gods and done other things. Well, next week we're going to be talking about Amos and talking about these issues that are really close to God's heart that Israel got in trouble over. Edom has them in, his, in their story too. But at this point in time, they look pretty good. How, how many of you know it's really not wise? to figure out how God's blessing you by just looking at your stuff. I got more stuff than he does. God must be blessing me. I'm kind of, my family's in good shape and his family's had a lot of problems. God must be blessing me. And there's this sort of shift where you look at others and you compare to others and you say, wow, we must be the people because, boy, they're sure having a lot of trouble. There's a real problem with looking into a moment in time and, and interpreting the place where people are as being, as being somehow missing God's blessing where the good things in my life point only to God's blessing. How many of you have ever been blessed in the midst of a difficult time in your life? You bet. See, God is God no matter what your circumstances. His ability to be God is not determined by how good things are going in your life. Got that? Whether it's going good or going bad, he is still God. You can still depend on him to be God. Edom forgot it. And so they had become part of the problem. They had, they had celebrated when Israel was, was taken into captivity, when they were invaded. They, they lift their glasses. They drank some of their own wine and said, they had it coming. Look at us. We're the blessed people. We are the folks, Israel, who've been saying they're the people all these years. Look, look where they are. Look where they are. We're the ones. Nobody's ever going to conquer us, our cities and our, um, our places. They, if, if you've ever, um, it's funny that, that uh, Indiana Jones should come up again. But um, if in that movie, The Last Crusade, I love that movie where they ride down the, this narrow canyon and they come into this city. It's, uh, it's Petra is the name of it. It's Jordan. And in the, 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 what they call the treasury is this building that they're supposed to go into where he finds, are you guys, did you see this movie? Yeah. Okay, you're, you're staring and I, I'm uncomfortable. <laughs> Next week, after three services, we'll watch Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade. It should be fun. But in that, that, that building that they ride into, that room, that's, that's Edom. That's where the Edomites lived, were in those canyons like that. And they just thought it was impregnable. Nobody's ever going to bother us. We live on our mountaintops. They built their cities high. All of these things, they just thought, and boil vulnerable Isaiah, or excuse me, Isaiah, Israel said, we must be the people. So that's where they're at when Obadiah is, starts to prophesy to them. So turn with me to Obadiah 3. Yeah, you've been waiting for that. There's only one chapter, so there's no chapter numbers. It's just the third verse in Obadiah. And this is what he says. God is nailing this thing down because he's going to deal with these people. And he deals with them actually quite with, with a lot of finality. Um, how many of you have 
if any of you ever taken those tests where you, you saliva, you send it off and it comes back and they tell you how, what percentage of, of whatever you are, have any of you ever done that? I can pretty well guarantee there's not one person in this room, if you've ever done it, will come back with like 12% eat a bite. Because God said, I am done with you people. And, and, they, and you're going to disappear. And they did. There are no Philistines. You won't show up. Some of you may act like Philistines. But there will be no Philistine blood. Because there are no longer any Philistines. God said, you're done, and they're done. Okay? This is what he says. The pride of your heart has deceived you. What? What deceived them? There, do you understand this is the problem with pride? It deceives you. It makes you think things that are not true. And you're thinking them about yourself. All right? Let's just keep going. The pride of your heart has deceived you. You who live in the clefts of the rock, that's where they live. I told you about that. And in, in your lofty dwelling, who say in your heart, who will bring me down to the ground? So here's where it starts. Their problem was their own pride. We know the story of pride in the Bible. We can, we can point to it of the, this angel, Lucifer. He was something else. When God created him, God kind of pulled out all the stops. And there's a description of him as, as this, this angel. That Lucifer means light bearer. It, he's, he was apparently something majestic to see. And it talks about his pipes and the organs. And apparently he, he, was, he produced beautiful music. And, and there was, he was just like God must have had fun that day when he made him. But Lucifer got the looking in the mirror. And he's going, you really are something. Look at you. Look at you. And he's, as he looks on it, and that thought of look at you, how beautiful you are, began to slip over into new territory. It began to say, you know what? I think I could do this God thing. This is always pride. This is what pride does. I think I could do this God thing. I can take the place of God. I can do the things God does. I'm certainly as majestic. I'm certainly, you know, I'm, I'm certainly as beautiful. And so there's this insurrection in heaven does everyone know how that turned out? It, um, poorly. It turned out poorly for him. And he was thrown out of heaven. Why God didn't send him to Saturn, I'll never know. But he came to this earth. And he became the devil. He became Satan. He became the protagonist in this story. He was he, he, uh, um, the antagonist, excuse me, I'm the English wrong. The antagonist in this story. He becomes our enemy. He's the one who hates everything God loves. And that includes you. And he becomes the deceiver. So that's where pride goes. It, it begins to make you think things that aren't true. Edom is filled with this, this self-certainty. Um, but, but there's a problem. Um, pride is a self-deceiving endeavor. That's, that's the problem. Now, I'm not talking about the kind of pride, like take pride in yourself and, you know, shower once in a while and comb your hair and, and try your hardest and use your gifts and all those things that we ought to have just as human beings, as human life, to try to be making this world better. We're not talking about that as pride. We're talking about the pride that begins to make you think you can get away doing this life without God. In any place and in any area, and this was, this was Edom's problem. The Bible talks a lot about deception. Um, it says the, the devil is a deceiver. We've already talked about him. John, uh, Revelation 12, 9, John is writing this, this as he's seeing this great story unroll. He says the great dragon was thrown down, the age, ancient serpent who is called the devil and Satan, the deceiver of the whole world, is thrown down to the earth. The, the name Satan means deceiver. 
It's, it's a name of, of his primary weapon that he uses against us. He's out to deceive the world, and he does it in a million different ways. He does it in big ways and little ways. He is a deceiver. But the Bible also tells, tell us that, tells us that people deceive us. Romans 3.13, it says, Their throat is an open grave. They're, they use their tongues to deceive. Human beings are deceptive people. They do things and say things to use people and manipulate. And sometimes they do it without even kind of knowing about it, but there's still a motivation. There's, there's something behind. And so the Bible warns us about letting people deceive us, just like it warns us about letting the devil deceive, deceive us. But mostly, we deceive ourselves. This is how the enemy works, how the devil works. He, there's got to be some element in it where I am participating. I am cooperating. Just like I get to cooperate with God, I can also cooperate with deception. And so what I want to do, jumping off of Edom's story here, is talk about several places. The Bible talks a lot about this, self, um, this self-deception. It's kind of everywhere. Edom told itself things about itself that did not match what God said about them. Um, so what I'm going to do, we're going to try and save ourselves from some of this. You know, so we don't, we don't find ourselves in places where the Bible talks about it, warns us about this self-deception and tells us not to go there. And then I want to give you an antidote for each one of these things that I don't have to live. I don't have to live self-deceived. I can live in truth. And the truth does what? I want to live free. But you can't live free separate from the truth. So if you're believing things about yourself that are not true, you will not be free in that area. Just saying, I'm here to bring the good news. Are you with me? Okay, so here's the first lie. I should just call this stories we tell ourselves. Seems, this seems like there's no varnish on it. It's pretty, pretty raw. Our lie, our assessment of ourselves surpasses God's assessment even though that creates a vacuum in our usefulness. Here's part of the problem. It, when I believe things that aren't true and I act on them, even if I've told them to myself, I become less useful to the Father. Why? Because when I am full of pride, I am listening to the voice in my head and not to the voice I should be hearing. One of the problems... One of the problems with pride is you stop listening. I had a great experience this morning. The crowds have been a little thinner this weekend, but the first service, which is our, we call our Revere service. If you've never been to one, you ought to come sometime. They're really, I love it. We read the, we have a different kind of a, a reading scripture and there's, a, there's a, a, an antiphonal reading where there's a leader who reads and you read and it's all scripture and so forth. But um, I was standing back here just inside the curtain and um, our young intern was reading the, the, um, the scriptures today. And as I'm standing there, I'm reading them off the screen and in all these voices out here, I can hear my wife. I could hear Linda in all those voices. And it was kind of funny. I thought, wow, that's strange because she wasn't speaking any louder than anybody else, not using her junior high teacher's voice. She was just reading like everyone else, but I heard her. Why? Because of familiarity. She is the one voice I'm more tuned to of anybody that was in this room. And I heard her. I wasn't listening for her, but I heard. Now, she might disagree with that assessment. Um, <laughs> that I'm that attuned. But I am here to tell you by the fourth or fifth sentence, I usually am kicking in. I usually am. I'm hearing what she's saying. You know? um, though I, I do have to admit, at our house, the most frequently asked question is, what? <laughs> Anybody? You know, what it's like we, we talk to each other and because we're so used to one another, it takes a few minutes to catch up and start cat, you know, getting into the conversation. So anyway, so what, what's that? why is that important? Well, when you're attuned to someone, you hear their voice. That baby crying in the middle of the night after bringing bring him home. Suddenly, you know, you who sleep all the way through and... 
it's not going to happen like that because something's happening. You're listening. And when you are full of pride like Edom, you stop listening to the voices you need to hear. Not just the people around you, but you stop listening to the Father. What's the antidote to this? What's the problem? Well, what's, what's this going to solve the problem? Well, here it is. That, that scripture, did I read the first scripture? No, I didn't. Galatians 6, 3. For if anyone thinks he is something when he is nothing, he deceives himself. That's the problem. That's the lie. That I can be something without God. And, and Paul says you're deceiving yourself. Here's the antidote. When tempted to run from others' pain, we run toward it. The verse just before it gives us, gives us uh, the answer. Uh, 6 2. Bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. And then it goes into anyone who thinks he's something. So what's, what's the solution? See, my true usefulness in the kingdom is measured by how willing I am to take the grace that God poured out on me and give it to somebody else. That I don't just become a keeper of grace. That I get fat and sassy, just getting full of the good things of God. And the, the ones around me are starving to death. See, I think God actually puts people in our way on purpose sometimes, doesn't he? People that in your head, you know, if, if you had the screen, you're looking at them and smiling and saying, oh, sister, Wow, what a story. Wow, I'll pray for you. And what's really going on in your head is, would you just get out of my face? I don't need your problems. Listen, I got up this morning and I handled my stuff. What's wrong with you? What's your problem? And that's what's really going on in your head. And I think God just sends these people to you because he wants you to not be self-deceived. That somehow you are above answering the problem or getting your hands dirty or being the one down there having to, be, having to be in the trenches with people who sometimes just don't get it or they're in a really hard moment in their life and you've got to have compassion when in fact, truthfully, as a human being, you don't care. But God cares. And he cares a lot. And he's the same God that cared about you and got you where you are. And now he wants to take that same grace and use you as the conduit to start pouring grace into the, your life. Does anybody recognize this story? How do we get over that stuff? You began to allow yourself to feel the pain of others. You begin carrying the burden. And Paul wrote in, in uh, Philippians 2, Three and four, he says, do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. That's good advice. When I care about other people, I stop being so taken and carried away by myself. Okay? Here's another problem. That we can practice religion in our heads that never enters our actions. This is James. God bless James. James 1.26. If anyone thinks he is religious and does not bridle his, his tongue, but deceives his heart. Don't need the devil for that. I can do that. I can handle it all by myself. He said, I deceives, my, deceives his own heart. This person's religion is worthless. Wow. All this time and money and my religion's worthless. Well, how about that? See, James is really interested that what's going on in your heart should be working its way out and into the way that you live and the way you treat other people. They should, you know, people ought to be better off because you're a believer. Real religion has wheels on it. You got it? It's got, it's got something in it. It's going in a good direction and somebody is going to benefit because true religion is going somewhere that God is directing it. He's sending it down the road. James knows it. What's the antidote to this thing of having just the religion in your head? I, before I do that, I, I, I was at a meeting uh, a week ago last Thursday. Um, if you've never been to an Acts 4 prayer, it's a... It's a 
citywide prayer event that happens every month. And, and it, there are people from all over the place. It's this grassroots thing that us pastors are having to kind of run along to catch up, you know? People out ahead, they're praying for revival. They're praying for Reno. And, and there have been so many things. that so This meeting happened to be the fifth year that this has been going on. And so they were celebrating some of the changes that have taken place in our city in the last five years. Has anybody noticed that Reno is changing? I wonder what role all this prayer is playing in that. And that was kind of the question on the floor. And Dan Franks, who's the pastor up at Grace, I, I love this guy, the wonderful church. And he told this story. Some years ago, pastoring in the church, they, they're up um, off Rob Drive, on Rob Drive, and they were getting ready to do some building, and so they went to the city, and they said, uh, we're a church here, we've got so many people in our church, and we want to build, and we need to get our permits, and so forth. And one of the city councilmen stood up and said, we don't like you churches. You're self-centered and you don't exist for anybody but yourselves. You cause, you cause traffic jams, you cause problems, and you don't care about anything but what happens inside your four walls. And Dan, instead of getting angry, he, he, told, he said this thing was a wake-up call because it was the truth. They gave him their permits, he said, but he went back and he called all of his elders together, called his board together, and he says, we will never, ever again hear that be said about our church. We will begin to move out and we will begin to, to, to be somebody that serves this, this city. And what's been interesting, especially in these last five years, we have seen this in the mentality of church after church after church. Why should we just exist for ourselves? when there's a world that's dying out there. See, this is, you can't be religious and not let it do something through your life. Here's the antidote. It's not what you believe that counts, it's what you believe enough to do. All right, James 1, the very next verse. Religion that is pure and undefiled before God, the Father, is this to visit the orphans and widows in their affliction and to keep oneself unstained from the world. What does he say? Don't, don't come here and explain your faith to me. Show me what's happening because faith is in your life. Show me how God has been able to use you and move you and take you somewhere where you might not have gone without him. Love is that place where our actions and God's instructions finally finally intersect where I'm doing the thing that God wants me to do is that impossible this is how you stay out of self-deception I just make sure that whatever God gives me I give it to somebody else as fast as I can and I keep giving it I keep giving it I keep giving it here's another one here's the lie that somehow you can understand God without revealing without him revealing himself to us for we never See life clearly without him. 1 Corinthians 3.18. Let no one deceive himself. Here it is again. It kind of sounds like it's a problem. Let no one deceive himself. If anyone among you thinks that he is wise in this age, let him become a fool that he may become wise. He's not saying be a fool. He's just saying, listen, if you think what you need in this world, what you need to know is going to come from some other resource but me, you are mistaken. That I somehow have, have enough gifts um, and, and I'm smart enough to understand God. I have the right information. See, um, does everybody understand that information itself does not have enough power to transform you? Lots of people have lots of information. They're, they're, they're full of it. I, I, uh, um, um, with an individual who was a family counselor, and um, I met them through kind of a, I, I didn't know them, but I was at an event, and somehow we got to talking. And so I started asking this individual about their, their um, practice and so they went on and on fairly eloquently about you know, why they'd help things they'd done and so forth and I, somehow um, I just got the feeling that all was not well you know and so I said hey, well how about you how are you 
oh, I'm fine, I'm doing, I'm doing well. And just, you know, how some people say that, you know it's not true. And I said, so how are things in your home? And he proceeds to tell me about, you know, marriage number three. This one's falling apart. Here he is, a marriage and family counselor, and he doesn't know how to hold his own world apart, uh, together. Excuse me. It's falling apart. What's the problem? There's a gap between what I know and what I apply. There's a problem. There's something missing. When I'm wise in this world, but I'm, I'm looking for my wisdom from another place, there's, there's a gap. There's a problem. What's the antidote to this problem? Well, the Holy Spirit seeks to orient people in, uh, to the Father's agenda. This is 1 Corinthians. Did I read that? Let no one deceive himself. 18. This is a couple verses earlier in verse 16. Do you not know that you are God's temple and that God's Spirit dwells in you? Here's the secret. Here's the answer. We talked about this last week. Now, go back and watch last week's sermon if you missed it. The, the sermon on Joel that minor prophet, because in that, he talks about this moment in time that he calls the, the, the day of the Lord. And, and it's, a, it's a moment not just when God comes back with lightning and thunder, but it's when God comes to inhabit his people. And so he sends the Holy Spirit on that day, and everything changes because the one who has been with you is now going to be in you, and the game changes completely. And, and Paul is writing here, and he's reminding people, we always have the Holy Spirit to direct us. He is, in fact, the Spirit of truth. That's who Jesus called us. See, um, we're, not, we're not people without help. I used this analogy um, before, years ago, when I could afford it. Uh, I used to fly and loved it. But I remember my instructor telling me the day I'm starting to learn how to use the, the radios and how you can beam in on a, even a, 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 just a ra radio signal. Like I'm flying from out where I lived at the time in Yarrington. I want to fly to Reno. I can find a radio station and beam in. My, you know, the, I'll stay right on that beam. That's how all of the, the uh, autopilots work is that they, you get a, a, a radio beam, a beacon, and, and you follow that beacon. And then when you get to that point, you, you recalibrate to the next one and you stay right on track. And he said, now you can, you can learn to do it. You need to learn how to fly without, without those instruments, you know, the dead reckoning. He said, but here's the problem. You leave the airport in Yarrington and you're headed towards Yer to Reno because, you know, Reno's kind of like in that direction, over there, and I'm heading, but I'm just sort of doing it. You know, I'm not, I'm not taking any readings. I'm not, I'm not checking my compass. I'm just going. Well, when I'm, when I'm five miles out from the airport in, in Harrington, no big deal. Easy adjustment, right? But the closer I get to my destination and I'm following this other track, what begins to happen? I get farther and farther and farther afield. I'm, I'm getting farther away. And at the point I realize I'm not on track, I don't have enough gas to get where I want to go. Are you following me? So off, I'm off a little bit. Who cares? Who cares? Remember a guy, we, um, he was actually a, a deacon on, um, in our church. And um, I... It came back to me that there had been some really shady business practices, that he had done some things in, in town that um, people were beginning to talk. And um, I'd heard this before, but I'd never been able to prove it. Well, of course, you call that person in, that individual in, and I said, hey, um, what's going on here? I'm hearing this. Is it true? You know, we need to talk about this. And, and he went, yeah, it's true. And I said, well, as a Christian, how did, you, how did you excuse yourself? How did you let yourself off the hook to do Because what you did might not have been illegal, but it was certainly immoral. It, it, it's certainly, you know, it, it's bringing, a, it's, it's bringing a, a, a stain on Jesus' name, not to mention our church. He says, oh, not a problem. He says, I know how it works. I do what I do, and then I ask for forgiveness. And he knew the sermon about forgiveness. He, you know, he quoted a forgiveness verse to me. And, and 
It, I go, well, that's not how that works. <laughs> Stupid. <laughs> you know, actually, actually, I didn't say that. I said, dummy. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I said, do you really believe that's how this thing works? He goes, oh, yeah. <laughs> not a problem. You know, I, I, I don't really have a problem here. He said, I, I just asked for forgiveness, and I, I know I'm fine. I said, you can't keep doing this. The Holy Spirit in you is, is going to tell you another story. That is not a voice you want to silence in your head. You want him talking to you, well, even when you're wrong. The antidote, no, God is going to bring you back around. He's going to teach you and point you in the direction you're supposed to go. Here's the last one. You guys don't know how hard it is to preach three of these because sometimes you don't remember. Did I say that already? You know, or was that last sermon? Maybe it was the first sermon. Yeah. Maybe I'll just film one and you just sit here and watch it. Here's the, here's the fifth one. We don't have to be responsible for our offenses. That last illustration would have worked perfectly for this one. First John 1 John 1.8. Did I read the scripture above? Yes, I did. All right. I'm on, I'm on board here, getting tired. We don't have to be responsible for our offenses, 1 John 1, 8. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. There, there it is. If you deceive yourself. The devil didn't even, he, he went and bothered somebody else. He didn't have to bother you. You're doing it for yourself. If you say you have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. There is one of the more frightening statements in the New Testament. There's a, a lot of people who do this. See, we're, we're sneaky, though. Because none of us, if I say, is, is there sin in you? You're, yes, pastor, of course there is. Well, yeah, we're not going to admit there's no sin. That's not how we do it, is it? What we do is we minimize the sin that sin us. We already know about it. We already know this thing is going on, but we allow ourselves to continue in it because we convince ourselves that it really isn't that serious. I'm not hurting anybody. Who knows about this? Nobody knows. I can carry on. I can, I, I can go on. And besides, you know, it's like, who am I? I'm, I'm kind of insignificant. The church isn't going down. If, you know. And so we begin to excuse ourselves. I need this. I want this. You know? I, th this helps me be a better person. You know, we tell ourselves these stories. We, we, don't, we don't deny the sin. We just minimize the sin. Does everyone understand it's pretty much the same thing? Because the, to what level you minimize it is the level that you are vacant of truth. Truth is missing in that area of your life. Truth sets you free. God's interested in you. He's interested in this stuff, and he wants you to be free. So what's, what is it? How do we get out of this? The antidote, 1 John 1, 9, very next verse. Jesus is ready to forgive anything we're willing to own and confess. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. How do we get out of this? How do I stay out of this thing of this self-deception that says I'm really not that bad. I'm really a pretty good person. You know what? Just own it. No matter what grade you think your sin is, you know, what scale you use, one to ten, oh, this is only a three. Instead of that, you confess it and say I am that, even if that thing's not broken in your life. You own it, and you confess it, and you get it taken care of. In Psalms 19, it's a wonderful psalm because the psalm is about the revelation of God and how I see and understand God. And the, and the psalmist starts really big. He starts out in the cosmos. And he says, you're looking at the, at the heavens. The heavens declare the glory of God. The firmament shows his handiwork. Day unto day utter speech. Night unto night shows knowledge. And you're going, oh, I get this feeling when I'm outside in nature and I'm looking up at this great sky, uh, this feeling that, that something bigger is out there. Well, you're supposed to feel that. That's why heaven's so, the, the heavens are so impressive. So even, you know, my thick skull can be impressed. But the psalmist keeps going. And, and he begins to run it into a funnel. 
and it gets tighter and tighter and, and suddenly it's not this big general revelation. It becomes pretty personal because he finally brings it down to this point where it's talking about my hidden faults, my hidden sins. I mean, that's getting kind of personal. And it brings it down to this place of the psalmist. It's a prayer where, where he's asking God to not let go of him. Don't give up on me. The, the revelation that I have, it needs to take me somewhere. And he ends with this verse in verse 14, Psalms 19. Let the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable. Where? Your sight. Your sight, not my own sight or the guy next to me or even my wife's sight. Those are good places to be. But Lord, I want this to be, I want even the secrets to be pleasing to you. Be acceptable in your sight, O oh Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Heavenly Father, thank you for Obadiah who saw it and called it what it was. Lord, our pride deceives us. It takes us places you never meant us to be. We believe things, Lord. We don't hear you. We miss others. We don't function well when we're self-deceived. Lord, I just pray we become honest people. Lord, that, that you make us transparent. People, Lord, who understand that you have rights, all rights and privileges to our lives, to the secrets, to our past, to our moment that we're living in. Lord, to our future, it all belongs to you. And when you get a hold of us, Lord, we are better. We become better. We are better. We bless you, Lord, and we honor you and we thank you. You are a good, good God. Bless the people, Father. We pray for those traveling and moving about on this weekend. Bless them in their endeavors, their families. Keep all safe, Father, we pray. Bless these, your people, in Jesus' name, amen.